He's a hustler, unbreakable, a people's person, and a future billionaire. This is the Hustler's Corner with Smoothie Soliope, well known to you and I as DJ Smooth. Hey, hello everyone. This is DJ Swoo straight out of Johannesburg in South Africa. Thank you very much once again for tuning in, guys. We really appreciate it. Before we get started, as usual, we go straight to that sharp, sharp sign. On the count of three, we're clicking those sharp, sharp signs. One, two, three, let's go. Click, click, click. Thank you very much. Now, the person I'm sitting with is one of the most amazing um, young people this country has produced. I think, um, you know, there's the classifiers with different classifications like there's the millennials there's the generation z americans would say generation z etc etc and then there's our parents and their parents parents but in this new crop of young people that are growing up in this digital age there's just so many hustlers out there that are hustling smart and i don't want to say we didn't hustle smart i think we hustled harder because there was no internet for us so we had to be out there in the taxis, knocking physically there from one place to the next for many years until one opportunity opens the next and then you get your breakthrough after you know a certain period of time. But there's just a certain crop of young people right now in South Africa that are hustling digitally, doing what they love and they're passionate about what they love. And she'll tell us all about what she loves, but she's a corporate woman young woman, young lady, she's in corporate. She has participated in different pageants. She, um, all the way up to the highest pageant in the country, Miss SA. She um, has been doing a lot of philanthropic work, which is what attracted me to some of the work she was doing in her community of Alexandra. But I think more than anything, what attracted me to her was her story, um, brought up by a taxi driver and just an ordinary family from Mekasi but also the fact that we are all in the same industry, the media industry. So she's worked for Soedo Television, she has podcasted, she has been a news reader. She's literally a hustler like you and I. Ladies and gents, please welcome to the Hustlers Corner, we Ilo Mahabe. Thank you so much, Sue. That was probably the best intro I I've received it? in a while. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, I'm actually thinking about it now as I'm doing the intro. I'm like, I forgot to ask you your profile, <laughs> you know? No, you did very well, spot on. I was like, oh, how did you know all of that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think maybe let's give it to you. Yeah. In the summary, before we, we get into where the story started. Yeah. In summary, when somebody asks you, like, who's Bui Pula Mabi? I mean, yeah. what do you do? What are your titles? Yeah. Are you? So right now I am, it's quite interesting because like the different assets or rather different facets of what I do, right? Uh, but to more broadly speaking right now, I'm a digital communications professional in corporate, as you've mentioned. And uh, I've also got a bit of a public profile where I do speaking, where I do, you know, the content that you see online on my digital platforms as well. So I think more all around, I would consider myself a digital maverick. Yeah. yeah. Digital Maverick is interesting because this is the time for that right Absolutely, now. Absolutely, yeah. Probably five years ago, somebody would have said, what? Yeah. What do you want to be my child? I almost was tiny. You know? <laughs> yeah. But right now, it's one yeah. of the most re relevant um, professional professions, I'd say. Yes, yes. Uh, and, and, um, and the company is Celsi? Yes. Right? That you work for? Yeah, correct. Uh, so I've been there for four years. Uh, actually thinking about it, I was like, wow, that's been quite a while since I started there. But, you know, it's been a big part of my journey and a big part of me actually discovering my place in corporate in this business world that we speak of. And I think what's exciting about being in a company like that is that you begin to understand the different elements of digital and the impact that they have on people's lives. And then motivational speaker as well. Yes, yes. So, I mean, that's been a part of my journey from as long as I can remember, you know, from high school. And uh, being able to share my story and share where I come from, you know, has been an important element of inspiring other people throughout my journey. Because I think most of the time, you know, we get caught up in talking about where people are and, you know, the glamour of what they've achieved. And, you know, being able to speak about my story allows me to take people on that journey with me. And I'm excited to get into that story. But before we get into it, let's yeah. also touch into another thing that you do that you are yes. media person so you're a yeah. presenter as well yes so um i did that for quite a big part of my you know younger life so i worked at soweto tv as a news reader and interestingly i started there as a political analyst and i was volunteering for some time um, i also started the news in alex fm on radio 
Uh, so, you know, that was also quite a, an important part of building my confidence and getting into the space. So I actually want to say to the people watching that go to your community stations. They are there for you. They are available, you know, and they're very open to having young talent involved. But be ready to, you know, offer your services and your time. And you're also an entrepreneur. Yes, that too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I mean, that uh, I think that has just come naturally from, you know, the things that I do. And, you know, as you've rightfully stated, we're living in a time where doing one thing is not going to cut it, right? And there's so many opportunities, digital opportunities as well, that allow us to branch out into different spaces and even different uh, markets. Because now, you know, whatever I sell here in South Africa does not have to stay here. It can, you know, cross the border and I can learn about other markets beyond the border simply from opening up my phone. So, you know, the journey entrepreneurship as well for me has been quite interesting. My passion for beauty, that's where it started, right? With the skincare launch that I launched in 2018, uh, my skincare couture, vegan skincare products. So, you know, it's been quite an interesting uh, learning experience for me. And, you know, as an entrepreneur, you go through certain plans, certain businesses, you fail, you get up, you start again. Uh, so yeah, I'm quite excited about that journey going forward as well. It's, it's so beautiful, man, to hear you speak. And you're so, I'd say maybe, not maybe, but you're well-spoken. And how many languages do you speak? Uh, three. Three languages. Yeah. So we're going to connect all the stories or all the different aspects of her life. But now we're going to go all the way back from Alexander. Yes. Now let's take you many way back, many years back. Yeah. Um, the type of family you were born in, the type of upbringing that you've mm -hmm. had. And don't be in a hurry, I've got all the time in the world. Just tell us your story. Like, where, where yeah. are you from? How did you grow up? Where did you go to school? Yeah. Just share with us. We'd like, to, we'd like to know your journey. Yeah. So, I mean, we below, I am from Alexandra. That's the, the place where I spent most of my young life. That's where I grew up and, uh, you know, got to experience a lot of key moments in my life. So, grew up in Alex, but before going to Alex with my mom and dad, we stayed in Ivory Park. Uh, also in my home, girl. Yeah. Ivory Park is Tembisa, basically. Yes, basically. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so we stayed there for some time. And, you know, my parents say that during that season of our lives, I was around six years old. We moved around a lot because we couldn't afford to stay um, for too long at certain places. So what we'd do is we'd get to a place, you know, pay the deposit. And then when it was time to pay the next rent, we'd move. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so um, you know, we eventually landed at Ivory Park. So at the time, it wasn't as... Um, uh, populated as it is right now. There was quite a bit of land where it was open and people were starting to set up their own structures. Uh, so I remember for some time, my mom introduced me to this um, oldest Yana lady, mature lady, who we called Gokum Zito. And we stayed with her for some time in her house. So as a family, my mom and dad and myself, we stayed with this lady. And um, one day as I was playing there, uh, my dad came. So my dad um, was in the taxi industry. And he, so my dad came with his taxi and all these guys with building material. So I'm playing there, you know, as a kid, playing house house with dolls and, you know, cooking and having your little kitchen like was Mamba the thing, Dile. you yeah. know. <laughs> so for me, then it was like the, the, the main game that I'd be playing. And because I, I was the only child for most of my time, I had kind of found ways to entertain myself, you know. So my dad arrives and is like, we're going to build something today. So here I am, super excited. And, you know, they start putting up the structure right before my eyes. And I was so excited because I was like, wow, my dad is building me my own playhouse. Like, finally, <laughs> I can have my own house where I can play with my dolls. And, you know, we can have tea and I'll invite my friends and tell them to come bring their dolls, you know, have a good time. And um, the structure, you know, came up. It was a beautiful, shiny, you know, structure, beautiful. And I was just so, so excited as a child. And then I remember the, the next Monday for school, I was so excited to go to school because I was going to tell my friends that, hey, guys, I have a playhouse after school. Come to where I stay and, you know, I'll show you where this is happening. So Monday comes and I'm super stoked, you know, to, to go and tell my friends, hey, guys, you don't have to play outside anymore. I have a real house that we can, you know, come and play in. So eventually after school comes, I've told the whole school and all my friends that guys come through to my house after school. Um, 
we eventually get to my house. Now, you know, the transport drops off kids, drops off kids, you know, so some of them had stayed because they wanted to see this great thing that I was talking about. And in my head, I was associating it with a dollhouse, you know, like little girl's dollhouse. Yes. So we get there and I show them the structure. That entire car of kids just burst out laughing. They're laughing at me, you know, hysterically. But I don't understand. But obviously looking back now, they understood what the reality was. You know, that wasn't a playhouse. That was the house that my parents and I were going to live in. You know, that was our family house. And because they had already been exposed to that life and been exposed to the realities of life in that place, for them it was like, uh, little girl, you got this wrong. You know, this, this is not yours. This is where you and your parents are going to stay. So my mom says for the longest time, I actually lived with them thinking that it was a whole big game and they were actually staying in my house. And, you know, looking back, that's a, a perspective or a mindset that protected me and protected my confidence because had I actually known what the real reality was, you know, that could have easily broken me down as a young child and um, over time I think I started to realize what was actually happening and you know the realities and seeing the differences you know when you're going in in your transport and you see where other kids are getting dropped off and then you're like but why is my house not like that and then you start to actually realize what is actually happening um, at that point I think when the the reality started kicking in it started eating away at my confidence. So, you know, my mom says I started being very timid and very inward and, you know, I wasn't that vibrant child that she knew who was imaginative, who was creative. And that really worried her because her and my dad did the best that they could, you know, to protect me from experiencing the hardship the way that they were, you know, as adults and just wanting me to have a normal childhood even under, under the circumstances that they had. So she says then one day she had an idea to put me in a beauty pageant, you know. She had heard some woman talking about how this is great for kids' confidence and it builds them and it helps them and she wanted that for me. And she entered me into my first pageant when I was around six years old. Seven. This is in Ivory Park? Yes, this is still in Ivory Park. Um, so it was, yeah, around, I think it was a pageant in Rabi Ridge. So that was like the neighboring yeah. more, I guess, you know, more affluent compared to Ivory Park, you know, at the time. And uh, yeah, so we started in this pageant and I did very well in the pageant. And for me, I just remember really coming alive on the stage. And I think that was the moment I realized that this is something that I, I like to do, that, you know, I enjoyed. And from then on, the journey just continued. And, you know, I just grew into it um, as I was going through my schooling career in, you know, in the pageant world. So so that's where it started for me. Um, it, it was very much a part of trying to, I guess, a, a response to poverty and a response to hardship and, you know, the, the lack of confidence in a young person that comes because of your background. So I think that's why for me, you know, the, my pageant journey is so much deeper than the titles and the, the, the glitz and glam because it has that root for me. You know, that's something that I, I know that my family worked hard towards to help me. And it, it has such a bigger story to it. So then fast forward, you know, into now we eventually moved to Alex. Um, I moved to a Model C school and then I started learning how to speak English. Um, yeah, English to me was very much third, second it was language. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, yeah. And, and sorry to, to disturb. Which school sure. is this? So now we moved. So initially when we moved to Alex, I went to Orchards Primary School. Oh, Orchards. Yeah. Okay. So before then it was called Darki Ace. It was still a very African school. And then it changed into Orchards. And then later on, I moved from Orchards to Fairways Primary School. Um, and I remember that transition because um, I, I had enrolled in ballet. And my ballet teacher, Leslie, at the time, all her students were from this particular school. Now, every time I came after school to join the classes, there was quite a big difference because I didn't know how to speak English properly. And I was very different. You know, my uniform wasn't as fancy as the other kids. So the other kids could tell the difference. And, you know, kids are so brutal. Yeah, I know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, mm. you know, they would really say hurtful things like, oh, you don't know how to speak English. Oh, no, you guys don't wear blazers. Or, you know, just things like that. And I think when she saw that it kind of 
touched her and, you know, felt like I, I deserve to be, you know, in, in the same space and uh, made a plan. And by grade five, I started at Fairways Primary School. And I think that's when my life changed in terms of now the things and the lifestyle I was exposed to. Now I come to a school that is predominantly um, Jewish and, you know, has white kids and there were very few black kids at the time. So now I'm exposed to this different lifestyle and culture and way of doing things that um, really got me thinking as a kid that, oh, wow, you know, this now I get to have white friends, you know, now this is happening and I get to see how they live compared to me. And, um, but it was a very important part of my journey because that's when I realized what I was exposed to. That's when I realized how far I could go. That, you know, the life that I saw in the township wasn't all. There was so much more, you know, now there were all these sporting activities, all these cultural activities. And, you know, that's when I, the, the things that I dreamed about or the things that I would see on TV became more of a reality than something that was far-fetched. And, you know, I'm so grateful to my parents because even though they didn't understand a lot of the things that would happen, you know, now there was a whole culture of sleepovers, for example, that was something new for my dad, you know, and he was like, sleepovers, why do you have to go sleep over there, you know, at this person's house? Why are you guys having birthday parties that end at 10 o'clock? You know, you guys are only kids. But, you know, that was the culture. Now, you know, when you come to the burbs and, you know, there's movie nights and, you know, things like that, that my parents just were not accustomed to. So I think it was a, a learning journey for all of us as a family, you know, where now they were getting exposed to this lifestyle through my own experiences. Um, so I'm grateful to them for having that open mind and, you know, just allowing, allowing the journey, you know, learning with me as we're going as a family. So, um, yeah, in fair ways, I was quite a, an academic. And I think for me as well, education was a big escape for me. Um, escape in that it, it took me to places that I, I could not go physically. But, you know, with my mind and being able to read and being able to engage in, you know, on that level helped me to, to think bigger and to see beyond my circumstances. And then at some point, because now I had become so engrossed in this new life, I actually didn't really fit in anyway. You know, you get to the township, now I'm considered a coconut. Yeah. And yeah. then when I get to the burbs and, you know, that lifestyle, I'm not quite refined. <laughs> exactly. You know, so it's like... <laughs> where, <laughs> exactly. So it's like where there was no real place where I fit in. And I think that's where I was able to kind of carve up a space in my mind, in in my life, in, you know, in, in my home that, okay, cool, I'm not either or, but I'm Buipilo, you know, what does Buipilo have to offer? And I think that helped me as a young person to really solidify my path or be okay with not fitting in, right? And, you know, one of the big things as well that came into play was, you know, now my dad's career, which, you know, I spoke about a lot during my South Africa journey, just as part of educating our people and our society as well, right? Um, so how that actually kind of became a, a big element or a turning point for my life was one of the projects at school was career day. And then a career day, one of the things that you had to do was come and talk about your, your parents' careers and, you know, what they do and what you learn from it and, you know, what you want to be someday. So here we are, people are putting together presentations about their dads and suits, their moms and offices, you know, something that was very different for me. My dad is a taxi driver. So it's like, it, you know, you know how kids are. It's like, well... Ooh, what does your dad do? You know, what does your mom do? And it's like, uh, okay, my mom is in between jobs. My dad is a taxi driver. There is, I don't know what the career is. You know, there isn't mm. really a clear, oh, what did your dad study? What did your mom study? And it's like, um, <laughs> I can't answer those questions. Mm. And I think that experience for me made me resent that. I resented the fact that, oh, my parents didn't go university or then they have because now I didn't have a good story to tell mm. I felt at the time so for the longest time I was very embarrassed about my background I was embarrassed by the fact that I came from Alex I was embarrassed by the fact that um, you know my dad drove a taxi and I was like dad why can't you just fetch me in a normal car like other dads <laughs> yeah. you know and yes thing. and that time it's not even a, a good looking one it's just that raggedy one 
you know, and you sometimes it'll get stuck. Yeah, you can hear it from down the road, and I'm just like. Yeah. Like, Daddy, don't come pick me up anymore. Yeah. No, you know, actually, it, it was so. I mean, now that I think about it, it was sad, but oh, funny shit. as well, right? Yes. I'd ask him to like wait down at the robot <laughs> where I could walk, where it was away from uh, the drop off zone yeah. at school, you know? Daddy, you're embarrassing. Me. Yes, you know, and you know, for the longest time, I was just. I just hated that. I, I didn't like my life. I didn't like my background. And, you know, um, I, I resented my parents a little bit for it because now I went into this world where their life and what they did impacted my social life. Like now I was labeled as, oh, the girl, the taxi driver girl. I was labeled as, oh, the girl from the township. So everything about my background became my label. And it felt like I had no opportunity to retell my story or change that narrative because my background had already done it for me. And um, one day, I mean, this is a very big part of, of my journey and my life where my dad fetched me and I, uh, that day I was just really completely out of it. I, you know, I had just had, had enough and I was just like, dad, why can't you just get a normal car? You know, and I, I just said some things to him that I just didn't understand. And my dad stopped and was like, you know, boy, Bilo, listen, I'm going to tell you this and I hope that you'll understand. Your mother and I have done, you know, what we could do with our lives. But even to bring you to the school. Yes. And he was like, those kids who are teasing you and taunting you, you are sitting in the very same classroom you are getting taught by the same teacher. It's like, do they separate you because your dad is a taxi driver? And I'm like, no. It's like, do you get the same textbooks? It's like, yes. It's like, do you have the same exposure and opportunity to partake in the activities? And I'm like, yes. It's like, how are your marks? Are your marks better than those kids? And I'm like, yes. It's like, that's it. You are exposed to exactly what they're exposed to. And right now you have the opportunity and it's up to you to change your life and make it better than what your mom and I could do. And I think in that moment, things kind of shifted for me because then I began to realize that, oh, actually, my dad is very right. Yes, I may not be going back home to the fancy house with my own bedroom, but I'm sitting here and I'm getting exposed to the same opportunities that they are getting exposed to. Regardless of, you know, how hard it was for me to get there, the fact is I am here. And I have that chance to change the narrative and to retell the story again and not allow my background to dictate it for me. So then that's when I actually realized, you know, just the, the, the power of having my parents' presence was, right? As much as my dad came with his raggedy taxi to fetch me, he was there. He did not miss anything. Both my parents were there for everything that required their attention oh, in wow. terms of school, you know. And then you start to realize that, oh, the fancy car kid's dad isn't always there, right? And then you start to realize that, oh my word, like as much as materially, I may have not had everything I wanted as a kid, but I had everything I needed and more in terms of the love and support that my parents gave me. And I think that's what helped also build my confidence to know that I have all the support that I need, you know, to move forward and to do what, what I want to do and need to do. So, yes, yeah, so now that, you know, that was my, my big aha moment of realizing that, hey, I can change the narrative for myself, which also then helped me shift my attention to my community in Alex. So from having the relationship of being embarrassed about the place, I started looking around me and being like, well, I'm here for a reason. And what is it that I can bring to my community that will further on, you know, help to change this narrative and to improve the narrative. And uh, I remember in high school, I started an organization called uh, Don't Get Babed. <laughs> what does that mean? Don't get babed. <laughs> so that was basically a direct response to the teenage pregnancy that was quite prevalent at the time. And uh, Don't Get Babed was basically me just, you know, twisting the word to be like, don't get pregnant. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> you know, you, yeah. um, underage. And I just kind of used that. Yeah, very funny. So at the time in, in our community and many other townships, um, you know, around the country, there was uh, the issue of a lot of young girls getting pregnant. And I was like, 
why is this happening, you know? And um, so through the organization, uh, which I named Don't Get Babed, I started having sessions with young girls to teach them about life skills and other things that they could kind of, you know, shift their focus and attention to. So what I did, all the life orientation programs we did at school and all the guest speakers and people would have, I'd like collect all the stuff and then take them back to present to my peers back at home. I remember in our community, there was a container, like a community container. So we'd gather in there and meet in there. And I'd start sharing all this information and, you know, talking about the reproductive system, you know, things like that. And that time I was the same age as them. So it's just that now I was exposed to things that they were not necessarily exposed to within the township or even just from home. And, you know, I started doing that. So that was my, that's when I started to realize that, oh, this is something that I really enjoy doing. And, you know, it started to align with where I was going and where I'm still, you know, working my way towards right now. And um, continued doing that. And then eventually now in high school, getting involved in, you know, leadership um, activities as well and bringing the organization into school as well, um, you know, and starting to get the support of people around me. And um, this is all before Miss SA, no? This is all before Miss South Africa. Okay. Yeah. Still in high school. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so... I mean, with that, I think that's when I realized the, you know, the importance of community, the importance of um, just extending beyond yourself. Because for the first time in the years that I had stayed in Alex, that's when I felt the support of my community and the presence of my community. You know, the place where I felt kind of, you know, I didn't fit in at first. Now I'm like, oh, I found my place and I found how I fit in. You know, maybe it wasn't necessarily to hang, you know, with my peers, but it was to do this. So I think as I, you know, progressed in my journey, I started to realize that I, I may not fit in in the, I guess, the direct sense of understanding what it means to fit in, but there's always a place for me that might be a bit different, but that's my journey. That's what God has called me for. That's what God has given me, my brains, my ideas, and my way of thinking, and the things that I've been exposed to for. Um, so I started making peace with that and understanding that, you know, I will go off on a tangent and that my path is not exactly straight. So into high school now, we have, um, so in matric, I don't know if you have this in matric, you know, like where you get to personalize your jackets and you have like different jackets from the rest of the school or jerseys. I mean, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Mm. It was a boarding school, but still like Nelis Nelis Korosako guys, Koso Shangu, for the age. Mm. So um, it was not necessarily a Model C school, but a lot of the things that we did there were pretty much Ntotako um, guys, you know. Mm. So mm. the culture from Model C schools we, we would yeah. be exposed to through some of our friends like you who mm. go to those schools, who yeah. we hang out with after school, yeah. who tell us about these yes. things, and we'd see you guys with blazers, we'd yes. see you guys all looking all zhong zhong, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I remember yes. even in, there was days when we used to hang around Carlton Center. For those who grew up in Johannesburg, you guys remember how, how popular Small Street was hey. and how the Carlton Center was, how we always used to hang around Carlton Center. And Dinaba Fundekasi, we used to like sort of tease the kids from Model C schools, but we wanted to be like them. We wanted to hang out with them because mm. they even spoke better English than <laughs> us, you know? <laughs> but yes. it, it's just beautiful memories that are coming yeah. up as you are sharing your story. Yeah, yeah. Oh, by the way, shout out to Sandringham High School. That, that's where I went to high school. Oh, okay. Yes. Um, yeah, You're so... You're talking about uh, personalized... Yes. Um, so the time came for us to personalize our matric jackets and you could pick like a nickname. You know, people have cool names. I'm sure yours would have been like Smooda or yeah. you know, something cool. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, I went through a couple of names and uh, eventually I landed with Cover Girl. Cover Girl? Yes. Okay. So Cover Girl, I had uh, basically taken the idea from America's Next Top Model, which was like a big show at the time, you know. And, you know, I was very fascinated with the, the, the modeling space and that. And I was like, wow, that's something I'd want to do, you know, at some point in my life. And, you know, kind of connected that very much with my, my pageantry um, as well. So I was like, oh, I want to be like the next top model. And but particularly on that show, the one part of it that stood out for me was the, the cover girl commercial that they did. 
So in this Cup Girl commercial, you know, you get to basically model this beauty brand and then you also once you win the competition you get to be on the cover of various magazines and that kind of thing and I you know I really resonated with that and I was like wow I want that and uh, so yeah my nickname was cover girl um, speaking to that uh, dream that goal that you know one day I want to be a cover girl I want to be on the cover of magazines I want to be everywhere you know I want my face on billboards you know that kind of thing without really having no real story or connection or to it but or, yeah, yeah you know I just I just knew it's something I wanted and you know that's something that I wanted to pursue at some point did I not get teased uh, for the whole year again <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know now kind of that that mix again of going to the the suburbs and then going back into the township. Now I've got this jacket with cover girl. Nobody understands what it is. Nobody knows. Nobody else watches America's Next Top Model like I do. You know, so it's it went back to that again of okay, cool. Here you are going on a tangent again. You know, being misunderstood again. But it was okay. You know, so I'd be walking down the street and you know the dance would be like, hey, cover girl, cover girl, don't cover it, don't cover it. You know, <laughs> and it's like what's yeah. cover girl you know yeah. like what are you covering and you know just things like that but you know I sucked it up I dealt with it for the rest of the year because I've got this jacket I can't change my name mm. at some point I was like can I redo this can mm-hmm. I maybe just change my name to Queen B um, but you know I had to just deal with it and then um, a couple of years later so it was four years so that was in 2015 not 2015 it was 20 when was I in matric 2011 yeah um so 2015, four years later, Clicks comes out with a competition called the Clicks Cover Girl Competition. And it was the first time that they were running this. And then I decided to enter. At the time, I think I was doing my second, third year of, I can't remember, but yeah, yeah. I was in university. And um, I see this competition on my Facebook and I'm like, oh, cool, you know, let's try it out. And uh, it was a nationwide competition. It was actually mainly based in Cape Town because they had like castings there. But if you weren't from Cape Town, you could do like a video um, casting audition. And I did that and I sent it through. And yeah, they just kept calling me to, you know, submit more things. And then I forgot about it. Weeks later, it was probably just over two months later, I get a call. That time I was actually at home with my mom. We were actually just chilling. I hadn't told anyone about me entering this competition. And then the phone call comes in. It's like, hi, Bupela. This is Clicks. And, you know, there, there was a marketing manager at the time. And she's like, congratulations. You have been selected as the Clicks cover girl 2015. Oh, wow. And I'm just like... <laughs> well, it manifests literally four years later. Literally four years later. Yeah. And uh, not only did I get to be on one, you know, magazine cover, you know, the Clicks Beauty leaflets covers, but I, I had three. Wow. So I was on three different, you know, magazine covers for that year, you know, printed nationwide, millions of copies in every store. My face was on every clicks. And, you know, that for me was another major turning point to realize the the teasing and the taunting that I went through as cover girl, you know, <laughs> the, with my jacket was part of my journey and my story. And, you know, it goes back to the things that you also say about yourself, the things that you proclaim about yourself do come to pass. You know, for me, that that was um, a, a very powerful sign and a very powerful happening for me to actually realize the power of words and the power of how we see ourselves and the things that we say about ourselves. Um, even though it took four years, which is another key element I want to highlight that your dreams sometimes will take four years or more right sometimes I'll take less but it was a journey it was a process you know I had to go through things I hadn't even forgotten about my matric jacket at the time you know but then I found it and I was like oh my word so part of the shoot actually included my jacket because you know that was part of my story and Mm. part of um, just my journey that made it unique and different uh, so, I mean, that was quite a, a, a mind-blowing thing for my family as well, you know. And again, my journey has always included them. You know, we experience all of these things together. Everything that I do, you know, they're on this journey with me. So eventually, so in Advits, I studied politics and uh, international relations. And how I actually came to decide that was one day I was reading an article and I guess maybe in my naive young mind, the article was talking about 
how you need to understand politics to change the world, you know, something along those lines. And I took it in a literal sense. And I was like, okay, I want to change the world, so I'm going to study politics. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so yeah. I went with it, and that was my story, and I was sticking to it. And yeah, I got accepted at Vist University. Um, I, uh, and I'm even getting to university. I remember, so I had had a pact with my parents that if I do well, right, right up until matric, that they'll, you know, they'll be able to pay for my fees. So eventually that time came and, you know, I mean, I, I was a fighter. I was you like, yeah, I'm getting this, you know, I'm going for it. And I remember in my matric year, actually the end of my grade 11, you know, we had a little meeting and they sat me down and they're like, you know, Rubillo, we're very proud of you. You've done well, but unfortunately we actually don't have this money. Mm. So that was another blow, you know, to be like, whoa, there's my, my background coming, you know, to confront me again, where I have to remember that actually, Mubilo, you're not from a rich family and you have to do, you have to have other alternatives. Um, so I started talking to the people around me, people at church, people who, you know, had studied and I was like, well, this is where I'm at. And I, I don't, I've got good marks, but you know, I don't have any money. And, um, you know, these people continue to help me and support me. And, you know, I applied for bursaries and I was able to get through my, my undergrad. And then from undergrad going forward into my honors and into my masters, I was funded by VIT. So I got this, the merit award. Uh, so because again, you had good marks. Because I had good marks. Yeah. So for me, I always knew that I always had to, overperform. I always had to overachieve because everything hanged on that, right? I had no other alternative or other options. I had to open those options up for myself by being the best that I could be. And I think that's that's a, a mindset and a state that I take into even my career and my adulthood, understanding that because I don't have the luxury of my dad being able to take care of me financially or my mom just coming to, you know, cover things when I can't, I have to make sure that I give myself those options by being able to, or by pushing myself harder than everyone else in the room. Yeah. Wow. What an amazing story. And all these years, and apart from you being teased at school, your dad yeah. is a taxi driver. Yeah. Your mom does from one job to the next. We yeah. are panda, yeah. you know? Yeah. Just like all of our black parents, mm -hmm. most of the times, by a panda. And I, I <laughs> you know, I'm laughing, I'm laughing yeah. at that um, title, In Between Jobs. <laughs> <laughs> Because I used to hear that so many times when I was yeah, growing up. Yeah, Maju, you know? Maju, I'm going to say, oh, yes. Maju, say so. Maju, I am in literally between jobs. Literally, in between, between jobs. you know? It literally means I'm unemployed. Yes, you know, I yes. move from one hustle to the next. You know, night. it's like contractual work that, you know, doesn't last. It's not a career. Mm. You're literally, it's hand-to-mouth kind of hustling. Mm. Where you're just looking for the next place you're going to get your bread money from. And then to all the hustlers out there, guys, what is such a, an amazing story that she's sharing? And I think it's a story of a lot of us, right? Good Lapis Puma Corner and our background sort of does come into play when we have to interact with other kids or when we even have to go to university. So they cannot afford mm. to take us to university. So what do you do? Yeah. You can't just sit back and just say, I'm in Angzwakala this year. Yeah. You can't. She says she spoke to people at church. She started engaging people that she thought would assist her. But mm. one ammunition that she had, she had good marks. Yeah. Very good marks. And then that gets you eventually into uh, sponsorship yes. and VETS sponsoring yeah. you. Yeah. And then you get into VETS. And tell us yes. about your experiences at VETS all the way up to uh, Masters. Yeah. You know, just to add on to what you're saying, um, before I get into that, it's very important for us to know the things that we can control. Right. Um, in my journey, what I could control was how hard I worked at school. Right. I couldn't control the fact that my parents didn't have money. I couldn't control all the other elements around me. But what I had full control over was how I showed up to class. And that's what I want to encourage everyone else about and to do that. Forget then what you've gone through, forget what is happening to you. What do you have control over? Because mm. that's where your power lies. And by me realizing that by, you know, showing up and doing the best that I could would open me up to other things, you know, keep me going. So, I mean, my Vista University journey was quite an amazing one, quite different from my schooling in that I feel like at that point, now I had taken control or ownership of my narrative by now using my story to my advantage. Um, 
after I won the Clix Covergirl competition, you know, that made me a mini celebrity on campus, which was quite cool because now, you know, that kind of helped me redirect my social status. You know, you know, you want to be cool. You want to be part of uh, something great, especially in varsity. You know, you've got all the clicks. You've got all the, the different reputations of people. And I think that's when I started managing my brand. I'd say that's the first time I realized the, you know, now the power of a brand or what a brand was. Because now, you know, I even started calling myself Vips the brand. <laughs> <laughs> like I was very literal in everything that I did. And um, yeah, I focused very much on my academics during that time. I mean, I actually didn't party throughout university. I probably went to two or three in my entire um, four years at Vips. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yo, I just I could, events. Yeah, <laughs> like it, it's crazy because now I look back and I'm like, yo, you know, all the people that uh, from the from the social scenes, you know, they were like, yo, we never saw you anyway. I'm like, yeah, because I just never was there. The number you know? of parties that you did in four years, they know you did in one week. <laughs> 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 yeah, you know. Um, but I mean, even with that said, the fact that I came from Alex was still there, right? Going to school, having to catch two taxis to get to campus, having to leave early so I could make sure I catch the last taxi. So again, the realities of your background will still follow you, right? I still had to make sure for a while I didn't have a laptop. So I had to maximize on the time that I was on campus to make sure I typed out my assignments quick enough so that I could make it back home in time, you know, at a safe time where there was still public transport available. So all those things are still part of me, you know, as much as now I'm still, I'm the clicks cover girl, I'm on magazine covers, I'm still catching two taxis going home, you know. Um, my dad is still a taxi driver, we're still in between things as a family, we're still trying to hustle. And um, and then during that time as well, oh, I, I was crowned Miss Alex oh. at some point. Yeah, oh, yeah, wow. Yeah. Okay. Asia, you know. <laughs> hey, I'm an overachiever. I'm not good at my achievements. You know, there's too many. Oh, no, but that, that was an important part of my, my career and my journey because um, that's, that's another part that really solidified my... I guess my reach in the community and my connection to the community of Alex. You know, now I was Miss Alex. Now, you know, I was the face of my community. And I was like, wow, this is a responsibility I take very seriously. And I remember doing an interview for Soweto TV as Miss Alex, as a newly crowned Miss Alex, and just talking about, you know, the things that I want to do. And um, one of the things that... Um, at the time, that's when I was studying my politics, right? And um, the guy who was interviewing me was also a producer of a show called News and Views um, on Soweto TV. So, you know, they usually would want like a political analyst to be on the show to basically talk about all the stuff that's happening in our political landscape. And uh, so one day we did the interview and then we did a, a snippet for News and Views. So I thought to myself, hey, like, I mean, I, I like media. I'm passionate about politics. How about I come on the show as a political analyst? So then I came as a political analyst, guest. And then eventually I found myself being there every Tuesday, um, every week. So they would fetch me from campus and would go and do the show. And then I'd come back to campus. So, you know, that became like, that was my debut, I guess, on screens um, as a young political analyst, you know, talking engaging and you know I thought I was the smartest thing under the sun because you know I would just <laughs> take all my political theory content and you know apply it to what was happening in the show and you know that that was a great part that also helped me build my confidence you know as a speaker and being confident in what I have to offer because um, that opened up more doors for me to do other shows other radio shows on you know big platforms and it exposed me a lot more to, to other elements and then I joined Alex FM as well. So when I joined Alex FM, I volunteered initially as a um, um, as a newsreader. So I was like, I'll join as a newsreader. So I, I like that. And let me just come in there as well. Yeah. And I emphasize this all the time in a lot of sp platforms that I that I speak in. I cannot emphasize this enough, guys. For you to get your first opportunity, you have to go in there and show value yeah. and volunteer, not to go knock and ask for a job. You're not yes. going to get the job. Yeah. Imagine how many people walk in that door asking for a job or emailing or sending their CVs. Go there and add value. Yeah. 
and you do know a lot of the places that you want to be in, you can research about them and you might find one or two or three things that you think you can add value in without having to ask for a remuneration in the beginning. Yeah. But once you've got your foot in the door, then you get the opportunity to learn as much as you can internally. And that's how you eventually get yourself in there when they are eventually looking to hire somebody. Mm -hmm. You get to one of those first people that get considered. Yeah. Or even if it's not in that platform, but the amount of experience that you attain by mm -hmm. being in that environment is so rich or it gives you so much knowledge that you can use that knowledge for the rest of your life elsewhere. Do you know what yeah. I mean? No, you're absolutely right because that's exactly what happened, right? So from volunteering at the station at um, Alex FM, that prepared me for my actual job that I got at Soweto TV from being a, a resident volunteer political analyst to become an on-screen newsreader. Now I was the primetime news girl, you know, and then that was a paying job, but it took two years of volunteering for free and, you know, allowing myself to learn, to get exposed, you know, giving my time, showing my value. So when it was time for, uh, you know, a promotion opening, I was the first person to get considered. And uh, that that was also a very, you know, big moment as well for, for, for myself, for my family, for my community, because now, you know, people were watching me on screen and it's like, oh, it's the girl from next door, you know, and so it's TV, being on DSTV, you know, was also a big thing. And, uh, you know, I think at the time, also my parents were just stunned that like, how, how in the world? How in the world she ends up on TV, <laughs> <You> this <know>? one? <laughs> yeah. And uh, um, I mean, even at that time, guys, three taxis to get to Soweto, you know, still using public transport. So like, I'm that girl on the news, but like going back home. So people are watching me at home. Yeah, so I'd be catching about three taxis to get to the studios. So now while my bulletin or my show is playing, I'm still making my way home in a taxi, you know? So just understanding those dynamics as well. And I think that's why right now I, I stand in a position where I'm so grateful for my background, for my journey and, you know, the hardships and the hard times because that have helped me appreciate the, I guess, the holistic part of success, right? That it's not just, it's not a destination, it's a journey, it's a process. And there will be good times and bad times while you are moving forward. So for me, it was just um, quite amazing that I'm like, you guys, if only you knew what, I, what I'm going through, you know, in terms of just getting there, having to come back. And then, you know, people celebrate the fact that, oh, you're on TV. Oh, my gosh. Like, you know, how did you do that? And it's like, oh, I worked for free. Um, I had to use my own money to get there. You know, I had to sacrifice some time out partying because now I had a job every day I was on the news and I still had and you have my, to look fresh on TV and I have to look fresh on TV and I still had assignments you know I still had you know we all know vids can push you over the edge but you know I had to fight to stay on top and um you know and I think that's that's what you had to understand about life that it's a give and take what you give is what you get, you know? And um, I'm, I'm quite glad and grateful that that's something I, I was able to kind of grasp earlier on in my journey. So now it's 2017, I apply for my master's, you know, um, in international relations, I get accepted and I was under the merit award once again. And um, so that year I decide, hmm, I think I might enter Miss South Africa. So I mean, it's something that I had been wanting to do for the longest time, but I was just waiting for like an opportune moment. And uh, in fact, me entering in 2017 was supposed to be a practice round. Nothing was supposed to happen that year. Like, I just kind of thought, okay, I'm just going to go and feel it out and see. I didn't even think I was going to make it to the top 12, right? Because I was just like, I just want to see. My proper year will be the next year, 2018. And because I wanted to give myself the opportunity to complete my master's. So I enter. Um, the morning of, I remember telling my mom I was going to an interview, like, very far away. So I had to leave the house at, like, five, right? Um... And uh, so I didn't tell anyone I was entering. I didn't tell a soul. So I go to this faraway interview at 5 a.m. in the morning. And it was actually up the road from home. It was at the Maslow Hotel in Santon. So, I mean, you can imagine. I get there. There are hundreds of girls. like And awesome girls. Beautiful, yeah. intelligent, well-spoken I literally felt myself shrivel up into a small ball. <laughs> yeah. I was just like, 
nah, there's no way, <laughs> you know? I was like, there's no way those judges are going to see me. There's no way they're going to even look at me. Shem, I can imagine what it does to you yes, psychologically. Yes, yes. Right? Because you know, I know, I'm, I've attended... Actually, I got on radio because I went through a talent search competition. There was thousands mm, of us mm. when I got on to YFM. Before, even with my television career, yeah. the auditions that I used to go to all the time, there yeah. was just all these awesome people. Yes, guys in six exactly. beds, guys what, 20, you know? like from Santi <laughs> and me, I'm from Tembisa. You know, I'm like, yo, yes. I'm not going to make it here. Yeah. So I know exactly what you're talking about. Yes. So, you know, I, I get there and again, I am, you know, my background, it comes back to me. And, you know, I start telling myself that, but who am I? I'm just a girl from a township. I'm not even that great. Like, you know, all those things that, the negative things that people say to you start playing back and you almost want to believe them in that moment to justify this feeling that you have, you know? Um, Because now I look to my left, I look to my right and I just see these incredible people and you know they I can't hold it against them because they also weren't asked to be born into what they were born to you know and and I'm there with a dress that I think was my best you know meanwhile people have like hangers of outfits and I'm just like guys I think the bikini that I had was probably I think is one I had even from when I was in high school oh, shit. you know like <laughs> so, so you like nothing about me that day had prepared or ready, you know, written on it. But I sat there, I sat there and I was like, it's fine, let's see, you know, I'm here already. I've been sitting in this line, I might as well, you know. And as I'm sitting there, uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about what am I going to say? Like, you know, what are these judges going to ask me? You know, and that kind of thing. So interestingly that year, the, the auditions were, were like the big casting set was set up in an open setting where Every, you, you auditioned in front of everyone. So you sat in, in your rows and then there was a stage and then you get on stage and you present yourself and say who you are and where you're from and then you leave and then they cut. So now it's more daunting that all these other people have to watch you. Your competition has to see what you have to say. And, you know, I'm just like, oh God, could this get any more worse, you know? Um, I remember the judges sitting there. There was Mops, there was uh, uh, Bridget, um, you know, Claudia. And I remember just looking at them and thinking to myself, are you, how, how are you going to see me? You know, yeah. out of all these incredible young women who are here, and I was like, I, I hope you see me. You know, I just looked at them and I'm just like, I hope you see me. Anyway, I get on stage. I think I forgot everything that I had prepared that I was going to say. And I was just like, this is who I am. And I'm actually from a place not far from here, just down the road from here. And it's called Alexandra. And, you know, the whole room was just uh, lit up. And I remember uh, Mops and Bridget saying that that's the one introduction that they'll never forget. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, so... Because you, you owned your story. Yeah, and you I was just like... claimed ownership of your, yeah. where you come from. Yeah. Your, yeah. Yeah, and you know, that came from the heart. And um, yeah, from then on, I just kept making it and making it and making it. And I remember getting called that, oh, I was in the top, I think it was around top 50. Wow. And then it kept going and then we had a shoot. All this time, nobody knows I've entered my South Africa. Oh, you didn't, I, you didn't share with I anyone? I didn't share. Because I, I was certain that I wasn't going to make it far anyway, right? <laughs> so yeah. I just wanted to go through this process on my own without pressure, without anyone you know, asking me about it because I don't think I was going to do well. And and you guys know that, right? Sometimes you, we only say, telling people certain things, it sort of jinxes yeah. your opportunity, yeah. right? Well, that's what we think. Yeah. And sometimes you just do certain things without telling anyone. Mm. Yeah. You just shut up and you just go do it silently. Yeah. Yeah. But then there's times when you sometimes you just tell yeah. people, oh, I'm doing this. Mm. I think maybe the better way to do it is to rather let the work speak for itself with the results yeah. and just shut up. Yeah. yeah? Yeah. But for me, not telling anyone was because I didn't think I was going to go far. It wasn't, I wasn't even scared of it getting jinxed. For me, it was like, you know, a side project that you do just to try yourself out. You're not really trying to make anything or much out of it, you know. Um, and then I remember getting a call uh, saying that, oh, I've made it to the top tw the top 24 finalists. And it's going to be held at the Maslow. And it was actually going to be, the announcement was going to be on my birthday. Wow. And it's a media um, event. So now I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't hide this anymore. Like, now they're going to find out. And then that's when I told my parents, my family. I was like, oh guys, I entered my South Africa about a couple of months ago. I'm in the top 24. Wow. It's going to be on TV later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
and it's on my birthday, so I have to go. And then my mom did the PRing for me, calling all the family members, and, you know, and like now letting people know because now they're going to see it. I mean, even after that, because I didn't get to tell everyone, people were calling me and being like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, you know? Yeah. Um, so very exciting. Uh, and uh, again, you know, I owned the story of where I came from. I owned the story of my background and my parents' background. And, uh, you know, that's when I went with the hashtag daughter of a taxi driver as part of the narrative, because that was a big part of, you know, how far I had come in that moment. And the fact that my parents were still very much my number one supporters. Um, and it was great because, you know, I it, it positioned me in such a good way that I didn't actually have to win to get the opportunities that I got. And, um, you know, going into the pageant again, like a, a life changing experience where I was exposed to this new world that, you know, I never quite knew existed. I mean, I had an idea about what my experience was going to be like, but I didn't know what it was actually like. And, um, you know, being a part of my South Africa, I'll always say, you know, it's, 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 it was a big part of me realizing who I am, realizing where I want to go and also understanding my influence and my position in the world. Um, it's an experience that really helped me, that helped fast track my understanding of my value and my role in my society and in my country and community and beyond. And um, and you, as, you went as far as top 12? I went as far as top 12 and then on the night I was crowned a second princess. You lie! You, oh, yes! Yes. I remember, you were second princess. I was second princess. Wow! <laughs> like number three. Yeah. Out of I all mean, those thousands of girls. Out of, imagine, like, I, I mean, when I look back to that first day I went for that casting at the Maslow and how I felt, I was like, I could have never imagined. And and who who won that year? Uh, Demi, who, was your, who was your queen? Demi, Demi Nell Peters. Oh, de oh and wow. And then Adia Van Heerden was the first princess. Yeah. Yes. And I mean, it was a miracle. It was a beautiful year because um, that's also when Demi won Miss Universe and yeah. then I moved up one to be first princess oh wow uh yeah so that was you know pretty pretty amazing because it, it you know it actually felt like god just kept on enlarging my my areas of influence and my spaces because by that happening it it it, it kind of kept my relevance in the crown or in yeah. the you know and I, I continued using it and i was like you know what i will be the best princess that this pageant and this organization has ever had. And, you know, that was my goal. And I was like, I will be the best in what I am and what I do as far as I can, as much as I can. And I think for me, you know, it's worked out quite well and how, you know, I, I couldn't have even imagined because it, uh, you know, I was, a, I was, able to grow. I was able to take advantage of opportunities while I was, still pursuing all the other things that I had going on even before the pageant. And, you know, that's a big thing I think we also need to understand about certain elements, competitions, or I guess goals that we have that they're not those things or those titles or those events, they are not the end in itself, right? They are a means to an end. And once you understand that, you're able to move on from things in a healthy way, right? Um, some people do get caught up in the fact that, oh, they didn't get the job, they didn't get uh, the scholarship, they didn't get the title, they didn't get that. And they but, dwell into that victim dwell, mentality. Yes, yes, and it's like, but your life is beyond yes, that. It's so much moving. bigger than that. So, you know, constantly plan. And that's the mentality of a hustler. You never content or you don't remain complacent in, in you know, just getting a tick box. You have to constantly evolve, constantly move. And I think already by the time of the crowning, my mind was already on my life after Miss South Africa. I was already thinking about, cool, what do I want to do after this? And uh, that's where my connection with Salsi comes in because at the time they were the main sponsor. And uh, part of what they um, offered at the time was internships to the finalists. But I wasn't planning on taking it because I had already had established my career in broadcasting and I wanted to grow in that, right? Um, but after, you know, having conversations with mentors and people in my life, I came to the decision that, hey, let me give it a try, you know, to diversify and to broaden my skill set and my exposure. Because um, I hadn't been in corporate before. I mean, I was literally straight from varsity into the news, into the broadcasting. And I hadn't really had like that kind of work experience. So 
I, I was like, I'll give it a try just for a year, you know, uh, just do the internship and then I'll go back. And then, I mean, four years later, here I am. It's been an incredible experience in terms of firstly understanding the world of business. I think it's actually an experience that's making me a better entrepreneur and a better um, thinker when it comes to positioning myself as a professional and as a business person. Because I mean, I'm imagining all the things that I was able to learn, I have been able to learn right up until this point, I don't think I would have been able to get anywhere else. And you know, that that's why I'm just so grateful to trusting the process and the journey and you know, how one thing leads to another, that it doesn't matter. Sometimes you might find yourself doing something you don't like, but keep doing it because that will lead you to the next thing. You know, every step is a step closer to, to your destiny. Yes, it might be a side step, but you're moving. I totally, I totally can relate. That's why I always say that to waiters, waitresses, because I was once a waiter. Mm. I always say that also to when I bump into the guys who clean the toilets, mm. whether I'm in a public place and I go to a public bathroom or toilets, and I find a guy who's cleaning there, you can just see nobody speaks to this guy, mm. nobody greets them. You can just imagine the number of people they see walking in there. Yeah. And you can just imagine what goes through their mind. Yeah. You know, I always take that one minute to be like, hey, shop me now, Tim. Yes. 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 Yes realizing that I just have to do the best that I can with what I have, right? And I think as hustlers, realizing what you have is very important, right? Realizing what you have control over and what you have, what you have available to you is important, right? You may not have money, but the fact that you have a cell phone and you can access the internet now and then, that's your power. You know, the fact that you can read and write and learn, that's your power. So I think for me, because resources were always so scarce, I always had to make sure that I use what I have available to me to my best. And for me, the platform of my South Africa, I view it just as that. Because I was like, this year is going to end. People are going to forget my name. People are going to forget I was even on this pageant. Um, so what, what can I do, you know, to make sure that I make the most out of this year and this exposure that I have? And, you know, that's exactly what I did. During my journey, I remember there was a time I really just couldn't afford the outfits, the, you know, having to, the hair, the makeup, because, you know, it's a journey, you're getting publicized and all sorts of things are happening. So I started writing to sponsors and people to potentially help me. So I started out with the, the clothing. I wrote to a couple of um, stores to help uh, sponsor me with outfits for all the different activities that we had. And um, out of many rejections and many we regret to inform you, uh, FBO came to the party. And you know, they were also quite a, an important part of my Miss South Africa journey. Cause now, you know, they, they supported me full force. They, you know, they gave me all the things that I needed from a clothing point of view throughout my Miss South Africa journey, even afterwards, and I became a formal ambassador of the brand. And all I promised them was the platform that I had. You know, I didn't promise them a lot. I was just like, well, I'm a South Africa finalist and I will punch you wherever I go, wherever I get interviewed. And um, so for me, it was again saying, I could have sat back and said, just, I guess, tracking it back even from school that firstly, my parents don't have money to take me to school. I'm just going to chill. I could have said, I don't have money for clothes to continue my South Africa journey. I'm just going to chill. But I had to realize what I had. What I had at the time was my zeal and my brains to do well and learn and study to be able to get recognized and to get the sponsorships that I needed and the funding that I needed. You know, here with my South Africa journey, I had a platform that now the pageant was giving me and that I could use. And that's exactly what I had to do to get the right attention and support that I needed. And I mean, I got over overwhelming support coming from all sorts of, you know, sides and directions. And, you know, it's endless people and endless organizations that I can list that um, have been a part of my journey and that are still a part of my journey even now, right? Um, and, you know, another major thing for me was 
the, the organization that I started working with back in high school called Ratangbana in Alexandra. They, so they cater for um, children who come from child-headed households and granny-headed households where their parents have passed away from HIV and AIDS. So uh, my involvement in the organization started way before Miss South Africa. And to see the support and the things that they did to support my journey was incredible, right? And I think that's, that's one thing as well that I, I've come to realize and appreciate about the hustle, that it's never just about you or about your greatness, but your hustle is actually for everyone else around you, that you are not blessed or put in that position for yourself or for your own benefit only, but it's about your community and the people that are around you because we, we're all, if we could, if we're just talented for ourselves, then what's the point, right? Our talents are meant to be shared. We look at people who are sharing what they've had inside of them for years and, you know, cultivating for years. So I think once you begin to appreciate and understand that, there you can go much further. And that's something that I've come to appreciate about the, the journey that I've been on and the experiences that I've had so far, that it's all been, it's all part of the community. It's all part of, um, you know, my role in the whole ecosystem of Earth that my presence here is important to the next person. You know, the next younger person who's coming from where I come from, who's looking at me, who will also make a change where they can. And that's how we actually change the world. Um, you know, one person at a time, one move at a time, one initiative at a time. Wow. What an awesome, awesome story. And I hope you are, wherever you are out there, you are inspired by this young sister's story. You might be older than her, you might be younger than her, especially the, the younger sisters out there. Guys, you can be anything you want to become. The sky is even not the limit. Here is a daughter of a taxi driver from Alex. Grew up with literally nothing. And it's a story that a lot of us can relate to. It's just all about, it's just all up to you. If you want to be great, if you want to succeed, if you want to achieve all of those things, because it is doable. And before we go, I obviously want to know how does your future look like? Because it's so amazing that you're sharing all these things and you're just only still young. You're still in your early <laughs> 20s. You know, I can imagine where you're going to be 10 years from today. Yeah. What are some of the things that you still want to do? Because you still have not started. <laughs> no, Maybe this is just the beginning. Not even. This is like the groundwork, you know, the basis. And uh, uh, I mean, in my 20s, what I've dedicated this time to is really to learning and just gaining as much as I can from you know, the people around me, the experiences that I had, the organizations that I'm in. Because one thing that I learned as well is you can't rush success. You can't rush, you know, great brands are built for a long time, right? You look at brands like Oprah, you look at her journey and you see her peak, the, the points of her peak, even your own journey, Sabu, just, you know, I mean, where you started and where you are now. So I've come to appreciate that and I want to build a sustainable brand and sustainable influence, right? I don't want to just be a one hit wonder and disappear off the face of the earth. I want my impact to go beyond just Alex. You know, I'm looking at the African continent. I'm looking at other communities and countries. And, you know, I think one thing that uh, the study of international relations has helped me understand as well and appreciate is that even all those countries that we see as, you know, fancy, as bougie, as first the world, there are communities there of people just like me, just like you, who are forgotten, who don't get, you know, PR'd, who don't get seen. I want to reach those people as well with the work that I will do, you know, as a professional and as a public brand. Um, so definitely keep out, uh, keep a look out rather for Bips the brand. <laughs> um, I definitely want to grow in business as well. I think for me, that's going to be a natural progression. Uh, growing in business and in digital, you know, digital is the future and just making sure that uh, I'll be one of the renowned names when it comes to that space and, you know, influences in that space from a global perspective. And um, yeah, just having fun while I'm at it and touching lives. For me, that's, that's what's important, being able to share my story on different platforms and uh, being active in the narrative of not only myself or where I come from, but the the narrative of the African woman, of, you know, of 
African or who we are as black people. I think as a people, we've been through a lot and I want to have my contribution as well and have my say in who we are in the future and what my children will see black people as over and beyond our history of slavery and marginalization. I want to have my my say and my voice in how we get perceived as, um, you know, a human race going forward. I like that. I like that the new generation of um, our community, as in black people, Africans all over the world, is not getting too fixated on victim mentality. And please don't get me wrong, because this might get read wrong. To be like, what are you saying? Yeah. It's very important for us to know our history what was done to us, what happened to us. Mm -hmm. But over the years of interviewing thousands and thousands of people on radio and television, or just speaking in public, being a public speaker and being an author, and, and just an all-round person who travels all over the world, a lot of us are still dwelling too much on that victim mentality. I really am excited when I, I hear young people speak like this, speak as conquerors, speak mm -hmm. of them as achievers as wanting to do global impactful things and back to and bringing it back to our communities yeah. so let's start seeing ourselves as victors as winners as conquerors as great as we are yes the history teaches us that we from africa and we're great and african people are awesome and whichever way whatever you can believe as far as your history is concerned take that as a lesson to understand your own greatness and about how awesome your great great grandparents your, or your ancestors were so that you use that to fuel yourself to overcome the mentality of just being you know uh, reduced down to what happened what was done to us yeah. so let's start adopting that mindset of being winners and conquerors and I'm so proud of you I can't help but be so proud of you I've been proud of you for many years. The last time we spoke was two years ago. Yes. That was the radio interview. Yes. And I'm glad that now we're catching up two years later. Yeah. You've achieved all of these amazing things. I can't help to sit down with you two years from today. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot wait. Thank you. Thank you so much. This has been such a wonderful, um, you know, conversation. And I think I'm also very grateful for, for the work that you are doing and reminding, you know, us as African youth and people who grew up in townships. And I think sometimes it's a very underrated experience and journey, right? There's so many things that we go through that mm. we don't always get to share and get to talk about, but the world just thinks, ah, oh, we're okay, we, you know, get over it and move on. But I'm so grateful to also see your journey, you know, inspiring and motivating so many of us online mm. um, with your brand and how you're positioning yourself and staying true to where we come from. Thank you. Yeah. And, um, we will dismantle this white supremacist system that keeps pressing us down. Yeah. Because no matter how much, how hard you can work, if there is a system that is designed to oppress you, it will be very hard. That's mm -hmm. why people like myself teach independence and entrepreneurship. Yeah. And I'm glad that you guys have realized that. Yes. You are not just only wearing a mouth, but I want to be employed. Yeah. Yes, yeah. you understand that you have to go through that journey to learn the skill and yes. make a living. But I like the fact that you guys are also carving your own paths. Yeah. That absolutely. you guys have got your own side hustles. Yeah. And you guys are also using the internet to your advantage. Yes. So I'm very proud of you guys. Thank you. And lastly, before I let you go, we'll send you this video in 10 years or 20 years? Let's say 20, right? <laughs> 20 years from today. <gasps> <laughs> You'll be uh, in your early 40s, yes, right? Yes. We'll send you this video. You'll probably have children. You'll be married at the time. And you're going to be shocked. With, oh, my goodness. <laughs> and 20 years goes by like this. Hey? It really does. I mean, <laughs> looking at how fast life is moving. Yeah. It's crazy. So I want you to look at this camera and speak to your 40-something-year-old <laughs> self. Oh, my there. God. What would you like to say to... Um, <laughs> Buipelo, who's like older, <laughs> who's like most like he's a multi-millionaire, even probably a billionaire. <laughs> you know. You're probably sitting there with your kids or some of your grandkids. Yeah. What would you like to say to that amazing lady? Hi, Buipelo. Hi, doctor. Hi, with all the titles to your name. 
I am so, so proud of you. I'm so excited about everything that you have achieved. Look at how incredible of a woman you are. Just keep going. Remember the journey, it's, you've started. You've started a long time ago, girl. There is no giving up right now and there's still so much more for you to do. And those children are still looking up to you and your community is still rooting for you. I love you. Stay amazing and uh, let's go conquer. Lovely. That is so awesome. Thank we'll send you. you this video. Oh my gosh, I can't wait. It's going to be so weird. <laughs> but so amazing. That's actually very powerful. Yeah, we do that with all of our interviews. And then lastly, what would you like to say to the youth, the youth of Africa right yeah. now? Anybody that's younger than you or that's your age and younger. Yeah. What would you like to say to them? What I want to say to all the incredible young people of our continent, Africa, is that Everything is in your hands, literally. I know many a times when we are going through hardships, we tend to think that we have no choice in situations, but trust me, you do. Sit down where you are right now and think about what you do have available to you. Think about the things, the people, the resources that you do have available, no matter how little, no matter how small, and start using it because what you have right now, what you have ex exposure to right now is exactly what you need to get you to the next level. So I want you to know that you have all the power that you need to move to the next level, to inspire your family, to inspire your community because Africa needs you. Africa needs this. It needs us and we can do it and we're going to build this continent to be as great as it was before. Thank you so much. Thank you. What an awesome interview, guys. Thank you very much for hanging out with us. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, share the content. Check out all the other old interviews that we have. This is a personal development channel. This is this podcast is just to better you, to make you a better person, to show you other stories of other hustlers, young, old, um, but just African hustlers who are doing great things all over the world. They might not just be in South Africa. So you'll be seeing a lot of guests from all over the world, from Nigeria, Ghana, Tanzania, New York, Europe, everywhere. But mostly it will be our African people, whether they're based in Europe or whether they're based in America, it'll just be um, those people that represent Al Kebulan. As I always say, guys, you've heard her story. Young people are doing great things with their lives. The question is, what are you doing with yours? Hi everyone, my name is Bui Pilomabi. I am a corporate professional and an entrepreneur and I have just been hustled by DJ Svu on the Hustlers Corner.